Hi everyone, my name is Tali Dekel and today I'm going to talk about learning to retime people in videos. Before I start, just a bit about myself. Uh, I completed my PhD in Tel Aviv University in Israel. I moved to the US for a postdoc in MIT with Bill Freeman. And then I moved just across the street and joined Bill's research group in Google. In a few months, I'm moving back to Israel and joining the Weizmann Institute as an assistant professor. My work uh, lies at the intersection of computer vision, computer graphics, and machine learning. Other than that, I have another full-time job, being a mom. Itamar is six and a half years old, Adam is four, and Ronnie is two and a half months old. Good news is that it turns out that they are pretty useful for research, so expect lots of kids' videos. So today, I'm going to talk about retiming people in videos. What I mean by that is that we want to change the speed of frames, or the speed of individual people within frames, in order to enhance the way we perceive video content. We see such retiming effects in films all the time. So for example, slow-mo, Fast speed, or a combination of them, are used to focus the viewer on specific motions or events in the video. Of course, to produce such effects, we need special cameras and lots of staging. So today I'm going to talk about how retiming effects can be achieved in everyday videos in post-processing. So just a disclaimer, I'm going to play lots of videos that may not stream that well. Uh, so for best experience, please also check out the talk later offline. And just for context, uh, people in video is something I've recently been quite interested in. I looked into different aspects of analyzing and visualizing people's geometry and motion. So for example, here we take uh, an ordinary video of this Olympic runner and we turn it into what we named a motion sculpture. It's a three-dimensional vis vi visualization of the structure that is swept by the runner as he moves in space. Um, in this work, we predict dense depth map for every frame in the video in cases where both the camera and the people in the scene are naturally moving. So I'm going to tell you about two new works. Both are dealing with people in videos, but focusing on retiming. I'll start with SpeedNet, which is presented at this CVPR. It's a joint work with an amazing group of people, and especially Sagi and Ariel, who made this project possible. When we watch people moving in a video, we can easily tell their speediness. That is, whether they are moving at normal speed, slower than normal speed, or faster than normal speed. We can do so because we watched people moving for many years. We have prior knowledge about how they move in the world, what's their natural rate of motion. In this work, our goal is to automatically predict speediness in videos. But why this is a useful task to solve? One application for predicting speediness is speeding up videos. Take this input video, for example. How can we watch it faster? yet without losing any information. A common way to speed up videos is simply to drop frames uniformly. This is, for example, what you get in YouTube if you want to watch this video at 2x. It results in jittery and unnatural motions. Our method can be used to adaptively speed up the video based on its content. As you can see, our result has the same duration as the uniformly sped one, but is much more naturally looking. Also, as I'll show later, by learning to predict speediness, a neural network can learn powerful space-time features that are useful for action recognition and video retrieval. So we want to predict speediness. As a proxy to this task, we trained a network called SpeedNet to classify whether a given video clip is of normal speed or sped up. Um, this binary classification task is simpler and easier to train than a regression network. We, train, we trained our network on a large data set. We used uh, kinetics in a self-supervised manner without requiring any manual labels. The main challenge in training such a network is that it can easily cheat 
it can pick up all sorts of signals that are unrelated to real properties of natural motion. So for example, when we generate the sped up example, we introduce aliasing. This aliasing can be picked up by the network to determine if a segment is sped up, while ignoring the actual motions in the scene. We worked pretty hard to avoid side cheats, so please check out the paper for more details. At inference time, we run our model in a sliding window fashion on a video clip. So we get a prediction for every frame in the video, and what we are visualizing here uh, are the logits. So going a bit into the network architecture, the input, as I mentioned, uh, is a 30 frame uh, video segment, which is first fed into a 3D conf network. This network is largely based on a state of the art action recognition model and it learns uh, space-time features. The spatial dimensions of those features is reduced by a factor of 32, while the temporal dimension is preserved. We then collapse both the spatial and temporal dimension into a single 1K uh, feature vector by pooling. We apply max pooling on the spatial domain and average pooling on the temporal domain. Finally, we reduce it into a binary output using a single conf layer. This network is trained on kinetics using a binary cross entropy loss. So now we can use speedness prediction to adaptively speed up a video. The intuition is as follows. We can keep speeding up a video segment as long as the network thinks it is not sped up. I'm not going to go into all the technical details here, but we have a good old optimization framework to estimate a temporally varying speed up factor. This speed-up curve, as you can see, changes smoothly in time, and it also meets the total desired speed-up factor provided by the user. Please check out the paper for more details. So let's see how it works. Uh, on the left, you can see the pool video uniformly sped up by 2x, so the duration is half of the original du duration. On the right, we used our adaptive speedup instead, so each segment in that video was sped up as long as SpeedNet determined that the segment is, is of normal speed. So our result has the same duration as the uniformly sped up result, but it's much more naturally looking. This is also supported by a user study that we performed that shows a clear, a clear advantage of our adaptive speedup over the uniform speedup in all cases. By learning to predict speediness, our model learns powerful space-time representations that can be used for other tasks as well. So we took our pre-trained speed net and then fine-tuned it for action recognition. Our model beats all other models that are pre-trained in a self-supervised manner on kinetics. We can also use it for video retrieval. We extract a speed net embedding for a query uh, uh, clip and then we find the nearest neighbors in the embedding space. We can do this for querying from the same video clip. So here you can see the retrieved top three results or a cross video. So this is the query clip and here are the retrieved, retrieved top three results from a database. And although, uh, so it's important to note that Spident was not trained for action recognition. So many of these nearest neighbors are not of the same class, but they contain similar motion pattern. So for example, a person surfing has a similar motion pattern to a person uh, free falling in the sky. We can also use SpeedNet to detect speediness in both space and time. So the following artistic video was generated by slowing down certain regions of the video. So you can see the people on the right here are slowed down. Shown on the right is a visualization of SpeedNet's predictions uh, using class activation maps blue or green regions are of normal speed and yellow or orange regions are slow down. So you can see how SpeedNet detects spatiotemporal regions of slow motion and of normal speed. So in SpeedNet, I showed how can we change the speed of frames. Now I'm going to talk about how can we change the speed of individual people within frames. I'm lucky to collaborate with all these great people on this project, uh, which was Erica's uh, intern project last summer with us in Google. So back to kids and pools. Here we told them to jump together, uh, but of course each child jumps at a different time. And as you know, uh, making kids do what you want is an impossible task. So instead, 
Uh, let's just retime them computationally. So here is our retimed result. All children jump together, and it's done in post-processing. Now notice how not only the children are retimed, but also all the scene elements that are related to them. The splashes, the reflections in the water, they are all properly following the kids. So capturing these complicated space-time correlations between people and all those time-varying scene elements is key for producing realistic retiming effects. And also it's, all, it's what makes the problem so interesting. Uh, so in this example here, if we want to retime that lady on the left, we must retime a reflection on the glass as well. Another challenge is that in many cases, retiming will create new occlusion and disocclusions in the scene, and these must be handled properly as well. What allows us to overcome these challenges is a human-specific layer decomposition of the input video. The key thing to notice here is that each layer not only represents a person, but also the scene elements that are related to them. Another key feature of our decomposition is that each layer provides a full body estimate of the person, even if it is occluded in the original frame. Finally, with our layer decomposition in hand, we can easily edit the video by manipulating the layers themselves. So for example, we can remove a person from the video by simply not rendering its layer. So where does the magic come from? Of course, there is a deep network behind the scenes. Uh, we named our technique layered neural rendering because it combines classical elements from graphics uh, with deep learning. Our network is trained only on the input uh, video without any additional examples, and it is trained in a self-supervised manner just by optimizing risk reconstruction. And I'll go more into the details next. We represent the appearance of each person in the video with a single deep texture map and the geometry in each frame with a pair frame UV map. We also represent the background with its own deep texture and UV. And in the case of a static camera, the UV is just an XY coordinate grid for all the frames. We append the background's UV behind each person's UV map. We then sample the deep textures using the UV maps. These sample textures are the input to our neural render. Each one represents a layer. We feed each sample texture in a separate forward pass into the neural render, which outputs the color image and the opacity map for the corresponding layer. After we predict all the layers, we compose them using standard back-to-front compositing to reconstruct the frame. We train the neural render on the entire video by minimizing reconstruction loss of the original frames. Intuitively, at each forward pass, the neural render only sees an, an explicit representation of a person over a static background. But in order to accurately reconstruct the video, it must also reconstruct all the time-varying scene elements uh, in the video, for example, the reflections on the glass. To do so, it is forced to place those elements in some layer. But why does it manage to pick the right layer? Why does it manage to place the reflection with the person causing it? So I'm going to give some intuition about why it works uh, through several toy examples. Here in this example, uh, it's just a person walking over a static background. To guide the network towards the right solution, we first initialize it using a rough foreground mask that we derive from the person's UV map. The network is then trained over many epochs to refine the result. All the scene elements that are not represented by the initial mask, such as hair or loose clo clothing, are learned incrementally as the network trains. So now let's get more complicated. Here we added two green squares. One is smoothly following the lady, and the other one is randomly moving. So let's see how the optimization behaves. First, the person is learned. Then, the square that is correlated with the person. And finally, after many epochs, the random square is learned. 
So correlated motion is learned earlier than uncorrelated motion. In this example, two squares are moving along with the person, but one is closer to the person than the other. In this case, again, the person is learned first, then the square that is closer to the person, and finally the more distant one. So nearby effects are learned earlier than distant effects. So now we have two people moving, each with its own square. We assign a layer for each person using these rough trimaps. Here too, the people are learned first, and then each person layers grabs the most correlated elements in space or in time. So the squares are assigned to the right layers. So let's see some more results on real videos. Here we have many people moving and jumping, causing complex deformation to the trampoline and casting shadows. Our method produces a layer for each pers person that includes only the deformation effects caused by that person. We used human key points to automatically align each person's jump in time. Here we show before temporal alignment and after temporal alignment. And notice how all the trampoline deformations, the shadows are all realistically rendered. Here is another fairly complicated example, a bunch of kids running towards the camera. We can use our method to slow down all the kids except one. Here the depth ordering varies in time. In this example, we're going to use our predicted layers to freeze in time one of the couples. Now notice how the shadows on the floor are freezed as well. So I just want to end with a big thank you uh, to all the wonderful collaborators on both of these projects. It's been really a pleasure working with them. And because it's a w women workshop, I feel I have to finish with a small confession. Uh, this is how I prepared most of this talk. So it's definitely not easy, but with a lot of hard work and lots of support, it is possible. So thank you all. And please check out our webpage for more details and results. Thank you.